Hey folks, welcome to another episode of The Security Table. This is Chris Romeo. I'm joined by my friends Izar Tarandosh and Matt Coles. The crowd goes wild. Or our, our one fan in Australia goes wild. Whoever you are out there, we're just sending you a shout out. And that guy at the gym. Who, and that guy at the gym. Yeah, the guy at the gym. That's a, the guy at the gym. Fans. Yeah, don't forget the guy at the gym. Yeah. <laughs> we're really moving, though. We've got, you know, two fans now. So, mm-hmm. But hey, interesting just, thing. Interesting, I learned about uh, Australia this uh, this week. So apparently, there is a, a a contest every year. Dance your PhD. So, like people who get their doctorates, they're supposed to make a video clip of them doing some kind of dance that explains their PhD. And this oh year's winner, this year's winner, is a guy from Australia that actually worked on finding out that every kangaroo has different uh, personalities. And that leads their social behavior and whatnot. And the clip, I swear, you have to see this thing. So we'll, go look we'll for it. Send it. We'll put it in the show notes here so that people can <laughs> tune in I, to I, this thing. I kind of want to. I want. I kind of want to see what somebody who did a PhD in cyber in cybersecurity would look like. <laughs> Jumping through I, I holes. Think- uh, they just, no, they'd be attacking, laying, attacking people. No, they'd be no, laying no, on the no. ground crying. That's that. Would no, be, I, be their I, I think it's called the Swan Lake. And it has the one where all the swans die in the end or something like that. <laughs> hey, dude, or, spoiler alert. Or, I haven't or seen nut, Swan Lake yet. Or, or, uh, nutcra- or the Nutcracker. Uh, the Nutcracker. <laughs> I never, I'm never willing to go watch that just based on the title. I haven't really too researched personal. it, but I'm a little Way bit afraid personal. of it. Yeah, of what that what actually that entails. Well, we should probably talk about something <laughs> in the realm of cybersecurity. <laughs> so here comes the awkward transition. Back to the building blocks, a path towards secure and measurable software. So this is a, a, a document that was released uh, around the end of February 2024. And it's a statement of support for software measurability, which I don't really know what that means and memory safety, which I feel like I know what that is. And so let's let's explore this topic a little bit and see what uh, we might have to, that's good measurability right there. So we can deal with the easy one first. I think we can all agree that there are more risks and more threats on the internet each and every day and blah de so we can skip over any introductory material. And we can even skip over the history lesson where they talked about the Morris worm I remember that one like it was yesterday because I was in middle school when that happened. I don't remember it at all. Um, Slammer worm. I do remember that one. 2003, I was working incident response at the time. And that was a <laughs> that was a challenging couple of days. Let's put it that way. And then even heart bleed, which we all lived through. They said heart bleed in 2014. No way. Was oh, it heart no bleed way. way before that. Fact checking. Heart bleed was way before 2014, wasn't it? Before? I feel Before like it was 2014. Like yesterday. Let me see. I was at TMC. So, yeah, that, that sounds Maybe like it was it. right. Yeah. Maybe it's right. I don't know. All right. Well, let's talk about memory safe programming languages. So, that's one of their, their guidance things that they're providing for us here is that um, we, should, we should use memory safe programming languages. And I'm just looking for a definition. Unfortunately, they didn't give one of what a memory safe <laughs> programming language is. Uh, but when you guys think memory safe programming languages, Matt, you have a definition. You always have a de- definition for me when I'm in, in peril here in the middle of an episode. Yeah. So, so memory safe, memory safety in general is uh, a computing, a, a part of a computing system that is has certain guarantees about when it comes to memory, memory management, and buffers. And so memory safe languages are things that enforce boundaries on uh, on buffers such that, for example, let's take an example. A good example here is C versus C++, I'll say. I'll go on a limb here. C is a memory unsafe language. Uh, I probably could use Java as the safe language too, but I'd rather use C++ for now. It's not it's close, close enough for this purpose. So well, it C depends, is me- right? Well, for the most part, so C is is memory unsafe. When you allocate a when you allocate a buffer in C, you get a pointer, and that pointer points to memory, and you're expected to know how big that memory is and what your bounds are and how to do po- pointer math, right? And when you write strings to it, there are there are string functions that like get s that will just randomly or 
just arbitrarily put data in, into that buffer and it will overflow if you allow it. As opposed to something like uh, the standard template library for C++, which has a string function or, or string object, which knows how big the memory buffer is and puts boundaries in your way. Uh, in theory, right? Now, there are ways to break that, of course, but because you can get ultimately you get to the, the C string underneath. But but the 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 library itself gives you guardrails, right? We like to use that term guardrails, uh, so that you, as a developer, don't have to worry about and don't have to don't fall into the trap of I'm putting too much memory, put too much putting too much data into a buffer that doesn't have memory for it. And so the theory is that a memory safe language would have uh, a natural construct, meaning it, it would have a type, say of string, that was automatically doing that bounce checking for you. You wouldn't have to use a library function like in C++ uh, and that the compiler or the, the framework or interpreter or whatever would treat all of that for you and take care of that so you can avoid memory exceptions, memory faults and, and the whatnot. So that's that's the general gist of a memory safe language. So what are those? What are those? What do we consider memory safe languages today? Then, yeah. So the industry? NSA the NSA has a list. I think that they've been working on um, the big ones. I think are are um, the the big ones with some caveats. I believe are things like Rust, Go, Java, Python, Ruby, uh, and and like I said, C plus plus can be can can include memory safety again these are all with caveats because many of them still will allow for direct memory access and have certain things that can allow the violation of memory safety but some of them have better better boundaries better guardrails yeah. than others and I, and I think I think something we can we can draw a parallel to as we're facing these memory safety issues that just came to mind is when I think about SQL injection Right. We've known about SQL injection for a long time and, and we've only recently gotten to the point where frameworks are doing good things to make SQL injection harder to it to add to your code. You can't, it's hard to add a SQL injection function, but there are ways, even with ORMs, object relational managers, to uh, object execute. relational mappings, mappings, mappings. I always want to mappers call it or something. Like that. I, I always want you always. I, you, that's, thank you, thank you. I'm always. I always want to give it its own its own special name that just I call it. But the point is, you can ex, you can still execute raw SQL. In mm -hmm. uh, most ORMs have that capability, so it's like you have, but you have to choose to do it. And so it's not. I wouldn't say that using like ORMs are secure by default. They're secure by. They're almost secure by default. But once again, you have that you have that need to use the functionality that sometimes you have to execute raw SQL because the ORM is just too slow to make the request. Right, and the same and with, the same with the memory challenge. safety. Right, the 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 whole reason why C is still a popular language is because you need to be able to do memory, you know, memory manipulation. Yeah. You know, say if you're on an embedded processor, for instance, and you have limited function capability, limited memory and and processing power, you may need to do that manipulation yourself. Yeah. The memory safety, I don't know the statistics on this, but just thinking about how languages work, I imagine memory safe languages add overhead. Right. Okay. They have to. Parenthesis here. Yeah. Can I call bullshit in this whole thing? You beep. can. Oh, oh, I forgot to hit the beep. Sorry. Because. <laughs> listen. Yeah, you I, can. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I was Please born inside of C, right? I, 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 I was. I, I came to the world of computing with a C compiler in my hand. And back in those dark ages, there was already libsafe, valgrind, mem... God, I forgot already how many different ways there was to go and attack the, the memory problem. Pure, purify. Because everybody purified came later and became yeah. other things that we use today. But everybody knew that that was like the thing. It wasn't even the skeleton in the closet. It was the corpse sitting by your side as you wrote code, right? So yep. people knew all that. I still have a but, copy of the Ten Commandments of, of C programming, and one of right? them is you, you'll, you'll love the bear. Don't the no right? pointer, yeah. <laughs> but my, my point here is that exactly what, what Matt said, all these languages that they are like memory safe, and yes, as languages, they are memory safe. But... Many of them let you play with the bytecodes that they create themselves as part of the language. An obscure part, but they, they let you do that. 
then you went to C++ and you said, well, there are libraries that make it memory safe. Yes, there are. But C also has libraries that make it memory yeah, safe. Yeah, but people didn't never use them. They never no, no, wait, adopted wait, 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 them. Wait, 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 wait. But then I go back to your to your example of the, the ORM and when you need to go and do the, the raw query. These memory safe uh, uh, languages, most of them, and I think that's fair to say that today, still, sometimes they're too slow for what they need to do. And that's when people get smart and they go one level lower, and lo and behold, memory problems are there too. Not to mention that the whole framework that they're built on, the, the compilers, interpreters, whatnot, at some point, it's written in C. So as those things keep being developed, or C++, C, the problems are going to keep appearing. I, I don't remember which CV it is, but there was a buffer of flow in a Java interpreter not, not, not a long time ago. Yeah. Right? But that's infrastructure. Like you can you can separate that into infrastructure used to build the software versus the final product that comes but out. Wait, wait. And the, the, the point the point that I was trying to make is is this really important? With all the other stuff that we have, many levels above the, the, the memory mm -hmm. corruption. Is this well, really where we need the White House putting their fingers in? Well, so so uh, on that front, so let's 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 just unpack this just a little bit. So first off, should the White House be getting in the middle of what what often is a religious warfare among among developers about what language to use? It won't be right? the first time they get in the middle of a religious warfare. <laughs> <laughs> so they have the, they have the expertise. <laughs> so so, but I mean, should should the should the government be it? So. I guess on the one hand, this is a recommendation, not a requirement, but it's a strong recommendation to do something different, right? Here industry, we, we recognize this is a problem, do something different. Here's a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the right thing to do? That's that's number one. Right? The Maybe world let's is on fire. Here's first. a bucket. Yeah. Well, but if, I mean, what do you, it'd be one thing if we could disagree with the guidance, that they're giving as as multi decade security professionals, all of us sitting here. I it's don't. one thing, that, but there there is there, there's really not a lot to disagree with here. Like I mean, do we outside of the political issue of should they be in this lane? Do we fundamentally agree or disagree with the guidance they're giving, which is which is move towards memory safe languages for new stuff? So well, I'll I'll just point out that they stopped a little short. Right. They said use memory safe languages when you can and then provide an alternative if you can't. Right. Moving to memory safe hardware and something called formal methods. Now, memory safe hardware, right, is taking what the software could do and make and enforcing it on chip. Right. Such that you have a controller, physical controller, hardware controller that handles memory. Which right. we have some of that, right? Like there's, there, there's exist, been some yeah. innovation in the last 20 years with like uh, the no execute bit mm -hmm. in CPUs, right? You can mark parts of memory as no execute so that technically right. you could have a hardware protection. And so right, I guess you I kind of ASLR, You don't have ASLR in, mem in hardware, I don't believe. Yeah, but the MX is like a processor instruction though. Like it's, it, it, you can, you can car carve out areas of memory that you specifically say cannot you can't right. execute from your heat, your so, heat memory, your heat memory yeah. more important. And so, right? but like stacked, things right? like that are just you, like, you those are so far software. below. Wait, you mark them in software, but you check them in hardware. The problem is that they get the hardware in enforces. Software. You set the policy right. in software and hardware enforces the policy. Right. So the moment that you, you set the policy in software, in theory, you can intercept, uh, intercept and change that policy before it reaches the, the hardware where it's checked. So it's, it's not 100% to, but at that, I mean, at that memory, point, at that point, the you know the 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 figure from the horror movie is already inside the house. <laughs> so that's exactly my point. Here, when when, the when call you start is coming looking, from inside the house. yeah, the call is coming from inside the house. That, but that's what I'm saying. If you're if you already have that level of access to an executable to the running a running process in memory, I don't need to worry about the policy. I'm exactly. already inside, and so. But my point is that protection is at the gate. So if you've hurdled right. the gate, there's there's nothing else. I mean, then then we got a lots of other problems. There's lots lost. of other ways you can hurdle the gate. Yeah. But, but, but my, problem, my problem is different. You you look at the depth of the thing. I'm trying to look at the breadth. Perhaps apart from Matt, 
Do you know many people on your day-to-day interaction with developers that write C, C++? Apart from Matt. You said apart from Matt. No, no, because I, I know that. what he works with. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, know. I, I do not. I do. Now, now, granted, I used I spent 11 years of my career at Cisco. And in those days, I would say, yes, I know tens of thousands totally. of them. Yeah, of course. That are doing that. Yeah, right. But I, again, it, it's the same thing with uh, the people that, that Matt works with, right? They're, they're writing close to the metal. Right. <laughs> Last I know, what was it? I don't remember the last time I saw a chip that could interpret Java, but I know that such a thing exists. Uh, they but, they uh, exist on smart cards. <laughs> yeah, true. We know how smart those cards are. But, <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, when I'm trying to educate developers in stuff that happens closer to where users interact with systems, uh, uh, in threat modeling, in uh, uh, interactions between systems, all that good stuff, I can count in the fingers of one short fingered hand the number of people who would even consider memory problems. Because you're in a I mean, high level language that doesn't have that we are naturally addresses things. We are in a, we are in a high level world. We yeah, but that's the whole point. World. That's the whole point of this is look, why not just give developers those those newer newer style high level languages that already provide the memory protection for we you. We already did. We are not even teaching With people what? C anymore. True. We, we are already in this world where 90 whatever percent of developers already live in this world where, where they don't well, deal we, with we memory We live in a web day. world. We live in a web world, right? Most so, development is being written in JavaScript these days using various frameworks. Like we're not, I, I, we're not interacting with Metal. Some people are, but the, the, the vast majority of the 30 million developers on Earth are not writing C or C++. Right. And so this actually How? brings up an interesting, sorry, if I, so no, this no, no, actually no. brings up an interesting point. So there was, a, there was an article that somebody wrote in response. Uh, they posted on Hackaday uh, where they talked about this being a red herring insecurity. And for that exact point that is our raised, if you look at the, if you look at the top CVEs, like the, if you look at all the CVEs that are getting created and you look at the weaknesses that those CVEs are coming from, a very, 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 very small percentage are memory safety problems. They are mostly broken authentication, broken, broken authorization, web related issues, oh, SQL well, injection. Then. Yeah, well, OS top 10 or CW top 25, with the exception of the buffer related items, there are still those because they do happen. And when they happen, they are really severe. Yeah. Right. So let, but, let, let's revert that question. Yeah. Would this solve any of the OS top 10 problems? Probably not the OS top 10, but certainly the top 20, CWE top 25. Well, I mean, Fine. there are, you can write web applications in Go and Rust. People do. Yeah, it. but. When was the last time that you saw someone say, hmm, I'm going to write a, a web application? Int main open char asterisk asterisk arg v. It I mean, doesn't happen anymore. It's possible, yeah. but it's yes, possible, you're right. But, but, it but also, but also what, I mean, when was the last time you saw memory safety or memory corruption as a, as a problem in a web application? I can't remember. Oh, I was keeping this one for the whole <laughs> podcast. Okay. So... <laughs> So no, seriously, so it, I, I can't so, remember. So there was a quote. There was a quote in the White House White House article that they, or, or sorry, there was a quote in the in, an, in the NSA. There was a follow up article from the NSA talking about memory safe languages. Like, what are memory safe languages? And they they provided some some statistics that Microsoft and Google were reporting that memory safety was something like seventy percent of their issues. Now those are not translating to CVEs. Those are translating to obviously if you run static code analysis across a code base. You're going to get a ton of stuff that hopefully never makes it out in the light of day. So, is this addressing publicly reported vulnerabilities, or is this re- re- reducing developer effort and workload by moving to memory safety? I would say that it's reducing possible future CVEs. But again, I, I, I posit that there are exactly three people in the whole country who read this thing and went. Whoa, that makes sense. We should stop, stop using C, C++. No, nah, I disagree. I'm going to disagree violently. So, okay. Not, not violently, <laughs> but just I'm just going to disagree. So, <laughs> but when you think about CISA, 
and the White House, what are the what are the categories of technology that they're most concerned with? Is it web applications? Is that what keeps them up at night? No, it's critical infrastructure and it's ICS. Oh, 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 don't it's take industrial, me there. But it's yeah, industrial. ICS, I mean, I, what, what is IC, what, what is most of the code for ICS develop the, the products that are running our power grids, C our water assembly. systems? They're written in C and C today. And Ada? so assembly. Which by the way is memory safe. Okay. But then yep. also think about this, okay? If you're driving a Tesla or any automobile, what is the bulk of the code that's running the safety systems in a car built, you know, that was that you bought this year? Is that mm -hmm. you're not writing that safety code in in Java. Heck no. I'm just explain you, I've hit my brakes in the Java why I'm process. Not driving a, a Tesla. <laughs> yeah, but I hit my if you wrote all my safety software in Java, it would be so slow I'd hit the brakes and nothing would happen for 10 seconds while I plow into a tree. And then it pops uh, up a message that says you got to upload your J or update your JD, J, 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 Java, or Java has Java has real time has a real time extension, right? I mean, <laughs> would you put your safety? <laughs> we, we could run an experiment where we run a car controlled by Java with real time enabled driving towards you, and we'll hit the brakes <laughs> at a certain point, and you can decide whether you want to test yeah, that. I mean, uh, I mean seriously, it, it is it is primarily going to be. I, I I would imagine. I don't know for sure, but I would imagine it's a lot of C and C plus plus code. Right, but it's, it could also be Go. It could also be Haskell. It could also be Rust. We don't know. Yeah, but something that's performance. But I think we got to get out of the web world. I think I think we're kind of we're putting web blinders on for a second, and I don't mm -hmm. think that's what they're. I don't think that's what they're focused in on is the web yeah, world. They're I focused agree. on so, the things that they care about the most. Rust and Linux kernel. I don't know a lot about it, but it does. Has it's been a long time. It's, since it's recently introduced. A kernel, but recently it's recently introduced. introduced. Yeah. Okay. And apparently, it's making a big splash. Apparently, you can in, even in a good write... way, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Apparently, yeah. you can even write drivers in it. So that issue of like memory mapped and shared and all that good stuff and things that you could overflow all over the kernel uh, might go away. And I hear that people are very, very enthusiastic about it. So that is a move that first I wholeheartedly support, even not knowing all the details, but. The little I know already makes sense. But uh, do we need a White House memorandum to do that? Or we just needed a bunch of smart people who decided to stay in a kernel and said, hey, this is a good good thing to do. Let's do it. I can't believe I'm arguing on behalf of the White House it's... at this point. Like, <laughs> what's happened to my life where I'm like taking the side of, I mean, but it's, it's a, it, it's about just spreading the word at this point, right? Like we've had so many of the same problems that have existed these class of bugs is what took out that was what the Morris worm, right? So Morris next worm was really week we're going to, to have a memorandum saying don't write raw SQL queries. That'd be nice. I'd I'd read it. I'd be happy about it. Uh, no, I, I mean, where do you go from here? Are, are we? Are you I, see where I'm going? Like, is the White House now competing with OWASP? Somebody's smoke alarm going off. Yeah, that's mine. Keep going. Uh, do you need us to call 911 for you? <laughs> no, I have somebody I think, upstairs who's working in the kitchen who I hope is on top of it. So I think somebody heard your comment about the White House. <laughs> <laughs> for our and we're clear. Friends, We've returned we to safety <laughs> level. Safety level zero has been reachieved in the house here. So, so, I'm good. so is our, are you are you saying? So I guess are you saying on the point of should the White House should the White House or the government in general be put, driving this behavior? No, um, no, no, no. I'm I'm cool with them driving this behavior. I'm just asking for is this the right behavior to be driving? Like, should we this, go way, 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 way above? Well, so I mean, if you take if you take Chris's view, which I agree with, right, that their focus is critical infrastructure and military systems and and you know national defense and national security, the water supply and the electrical grid and these sort of things, and these are all written in low level languages today, right? They have to be performance, real time performance, correct, you know, fully functional, fail safe and fail resistant, uh, or fault tolerant, right? And so that's their focus primarily. Right. And in that regard, they're putting a position out there and others can take advantage of that information as the technologies become better. Right. If anything, the government has always been in a position of driving innovation and, and R&D that 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 trickles down to the, to the commercial sector. 
I, if anything, the government used to be more involved in the security side in wait, the 70s that, and 80s. With DARPA than, and this. Yeah, and, as far as yeah. pushing the envelope. That's where a lot of guidance really came from in the early days of our industry. We don't we don't often look back on that and right. reflect on it, but that's where the bulk of our guidance came from. So right. let, that, let's take that a, and that and, a that and partnerships with universities, right? Yeah, true. Let's take a peek at that for a second. Let's let's say that the the reason behind this this move here was infrastructure. You guys know that the life cycle of infrastructure is way 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 longer. This is a fifty year solution. Software. We're talking yeah. about a fifty year solution so, here. Okay, so we're going to <clears throat> we're going to reap the benefits of this in twenty years. While for the next twenty years we still live with infrastructure that we know it's completely. Broken. I guess I got a little I mean, hung up on well, that what's too, the point? but yeah, but but I mean, so like, it, that's kind of and, a. And I'm willing to I'm willing to bet I'm willing to bet that the new versions of hardware and software that are coming in the market now that are candidates to substitute the infrastructure the broken infrastructure that's in place already come with enough guardrails and safeguards. To be at a much better space yeah. than oh my god somebody's sending me a packet uh, a ping of death yeah i mean but at this point like w <laughs> we can't look at it and go oh you know what it's it, you know it's it's we can't take the eeyore approach we're like oh everything's terrible and there's no solution so let's just let's just sit here and do nothing right we got to do something well, Is it, does weekend. it solve but yeah does it solve the problem today no i don't this doesn't do this doesn't solve the problem today this doesn't solve the problem in five years from now the hope is that by 10 years from now this shift in policy as far as what languages people are using are causing products to make their way towards memory safety and maybe you draw a line at some point in the future like 10 years from now and say 10 years from now we're going to replace all of this crap so if you don't have new exactly products that. that do this now okay maybe that's what should have been in here maybe maybe that's I would feel much better if they said mm -hmm. you guys have 5 5 years to rip everything out and put everything that's memory safe yeah. in place the then problem I would feel is much Who's going to write the check for trillions of dollars to pay for yeah. the the replacement of all of our critical infrastructure technology stacks? Don't you have a printer at home? <laughs> you print money? I, I I don't I don't want the Treasury Department showing up at my door uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they already show up enough. Um, yeah, so I mean that, but but I, I would say we don't. In my mind, we don't not do something just because it's going to take a long time. Like we got to get no, no, this that, ball moving in the right direction. That, that, that's true. But what, 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 okay. As a mitigation, what makes more sense to go back to the infrastructure, the broken infrastructure that's in place today, look at that black box that controls the flow of water from the reservoir and ask yourself, hmm, does that thing need really to be publicly accessible? Perhaps I can use some other network that uh, perhaps mm -hmm. most of people of can't get into. Well, I mean, most so, of that infrastructure so is not publicly rewrite accessible. Rewrite it from zero. Hmm? It's not publicly accessible today at this point. Boy, we hope not. Then what's we the problem? Know. I mean, attackers I, I, I have known to enter systems and move laterally and make their way through, especially nation state attackers that are highly funded. If it's laterally, then it's accessible at some point. Well, everything's accessible but, at some point. That's the no, challenge, right? You could say you could say the internal the, the internal threat, and, and I would wholeheartedly agree with you. I mean, right? malware but was if, carried into. I'm trying to remember which 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 Siemens uh, PLCs for uh, for centrifuges. Yeah, yeah, it was the Iranian oh, ones. Yeah, yeah it was Stuxnet. Stuxnet. Yeah. It was, but it was malware that was that that broke the air gap on a USB because somebody made a bad decision and plugged something in. And so like we know as security professionals, there is no such thing as secure. There is right. no, doesn't matter but, unless you, unless you disconnect it from the internet and bury it in your backyard without a Wi-Fi and power, like you bury it in the backyard with no internet connection. Then you can tell me that thing is secure. But other but, than that, also, you can't tell it's me. not but also because somebody's going to unbury it yeah. and, and, and get it. But I didn't the, even think the point about is that, threat. that yeah. something but like that. Your, so, yeah. Go ahead. No, 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 you go finish ahead. your thought. Something first. like that would be addressed in, internally by the government. It's between them and their and their uh, providers. This so is out in the public for everybody to consume. Sorry, I th yeah. I, I th no, no, no. You're making you're making an interesting point. I think that one thing to consider is this, of course, should not be read in a vacuum, right? Put this mm -hmm. with the with the executive order. You know, when it was a fourteen five hundred eight or whatever that whatever the number was, 
right? Where and and things like SSDF and the CSS secure by design, secure by default guidance, which you know they're all starting which to synergize here. now. Yeah, but they're up here. But they're meant. But they're meant to be looked at as a comprehensive part, right? And so, yeah. memory safety is one of those building blocks that you add when you. So you do threat modeling, and you figure out what your attack surface is. You make sure you have authentication, and then when you get to the core critical function that's turning you turning put the, the parachute nozzle, and you dive yes. all the way down to memory safe. <laughs> That's what you okay. do. So, so what you're suggesting is that the White how, House how maybe jumped into the pit before times, that they uh, trust the how ladder. How many times in a threat model do you catch yourself <laughs> saying, "Oh, wait, you guys are sending this big uh, a string? Are you sure that you are checking for land? Because you know, at some point there might be a buffer I, flow. When was I the do. last time that you whoa, raised whoa. a buffer for flow in the threat model? Secure, secure by I design. Don't, you don't count. I told you that you don't count. <laughs> secure by design sits above the threat model. Right. Threat modeling. So this is right. this is one of the things I've seen people and I'm not saying you're struggling with it, but I've seen the industry struggle with this. And and that is that secure by design, they equate secure by design and threat modeling as the same That's thing. Right. No, and I say thing. threat no, modeling no, no, no. is a support is a vehicle, is a supporting mechanism of secure by design. But it is not you cannot say I do threat modeling. So I am secure yep. by design. That's Remember, right. like choosing a language is a architectural choice which should happen at a certain certain degree of threat model. If you're talking, if we're going into the room, the three of us with an engineering team and they're building a brand new product from scratch, we are going to ask that question in some of the early meetings before we even draw a picture. We're going to yes. be asking about what language direction you think you're going in. Oh, well, we're going to write this mm -hmm. in C. Well, uh, well even, if, even really? if we're doing threat modeling, if we're doing threat modeling, I always ask, what languages there's written in because it can change across a, across a system. Exactly. Right? True. But not, not only that, but when we go into that, we are exactly looking at eliminating the class of vulnerabilities or of flaws that's called memory management, right? And lo and behold, we've been doing this for years and years and years without a memo from the White House. True. <laughs> So we you're not arguing. This into what you're we not do. arguing with the memory safety. You're just saying no. you don't think we need a. You did, we didn't need a memo to draw our attention to it. That's yeah, your point. I'm, I'm just saying. Hey, we 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 are up here in security by design. All of a sudden, now you're talking to me about memory management. And what's the next one that I can look forward to? Well, so uh, the counter argument shielding. The but, uh, oh my God! Let's go back to Tempest from fifty years ago. But anyway, <laughs> which, by so, the way, actually, if you if you could look at it, you could look at the latest work they've been doing about uh, uh, EMF from uh, CPUs and stuff. Yeah, and even the, the parallel memory reading. We're back at Tempest. I, so I, yeah, what's I, old I don't is disagree new again. with you. I love, yeah, I love Tempest. I mean, the the argument back to you might be. Who who in the industry would have would have launched this this um, this discussion around memory safety and why hasn't happened before? Right, it and has. because it, but it, but it, it has, has on a per on a per no. like the individual companies have done it. No, that's why we have so many tools that deal with this stuff. Yeah, but it, we, we so, we've I mean, there's been conversations about memory safety. This isn't the first time anybody's mm -hmm. kind of raised their hand and said we should use memory safe languages. This has been happening for the last couple of years as Go and Rust have matured and people have started to say this is a good alternative. Am, am I exaggerating? ITF, if you look at IETF and ISO, do you see? Do you see calls for what would ITF safety? do? What would IT? Uh, what would either low, of those at, organizations well, do? Well, ITF at low, at low level protocols. If you're dealing with with actual packets and buffers and like doing, you know, pulling oh, bits off I'm, of off I'm of the wire. That yes. Yeah, but they don't prescribe. They 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 don't well, they don't prescribe how you build implementations in an ITF standard. They well, they, they what, it, what it has to do. But well, they could, but they don't. That's a whole but other. Wait, wait. Uh, but e even even the move that we had way back when that we had XPC and RPC, and it would create these nifty stubs and pass data from one, one side to another. Mm -hmm. That was still open to memory uh, to memory issues. But then came proto, 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 proto buff. Proto and buff. everybody and jumped into that. Yep. Yep. And gRPC. And they have implementations for C and for C++. So that thing is dead already. Use use the right function yeah. parallel. Use the ORM. And you, you got shielded, <laughs> right? All right, we gotta we have to wrap this conversation up for today. It's been uh, it's been feisty, which has been good. So hopefully our audience has enjoyed uh, our back and forth debate. Uh, but this is a great it's a great issue. It's it's going to be fun to watch how this progresses over time. Thanks for listening to the security table. <laughs>